Hey everybody, I'm Sally Kleinfeld here on World Plone Day and I'm going to talk to Hido Stevens, um, who is, <laughs> whose name I just learned how to pronounce properly. <laughs> um, and he's going to tell us a little bit about Quave. Um, I've, well, maybe to start off, uh, can you tell us just real briefly what Quave is so the folks know what we're talking about here? Yeah, Quave is a... Uh... Well, it's a social internet solution. It's also a community collaboration platform. It's a knowledge sharing platform. It's a bit all of these, none of those monikers really, you know, are, they all cover what we're doing. And they all cover an aspect of what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. So something to be used in intranets, for example, within an organization. Yeah, but intranet has this really stuffy uh, connotation of mm -hmm. that you're, you know, and it's just like, it's like the place where documents go to die, basically. And that's, <laughs> that's not what we're aiming to, to deliver. Yeah, it's so it's a much more... It's a much more engaging experience uh, that we're offering, uh, and it's really closely intertwined with the whole social aspect of people, uh, you know, communicating with each other. So cool. it's a real close integration between social features uh, like chat and document collaboration, and it's all brought been brought together in, in our user interface and on our product, basically. Cool. Well, well, where did the idea come from? I remember it from oh gosh, when I think I first saw about it in the second Bristol conference. That was quite a few years ago, but it yeah. probably was going on well before that. So where did the idea come from? You tell us a little bit of the history of it. Yeah, it goes back quite a long while. So I've been in Plone since, I guess, 2004. That was like the transition from Plone to zero to Plone to one. And then I switched gears a bit in 2009. I started focusing on knowledge management. I did a lot of reading on that uh, subject and um, there was also like this fatigue at my end, and I think also for other people of, you know, constantly churning out new custom websites and not having proper resources to do that right. And then my interest just went to do this whole knowledge management aspect. And we, we like, we had Twitter at that time and it's like, oh, we, you know, we are doing quite old school stuff in Plum called the management. Can we like move that forward and bring this whole web 2.0 world of social communication and social collaboration? Can we bring that into Plone? So I started researching that. I did a pilot project with my brother, who was my business partner at that point, where we built like a zero and queue based, like, you know, messaging bus. And, you know, that's, yeah, that wasn't uh, the right way to do it. And then, yeah, so I looked back at my commit logs and I saw that actually, like, last week, it was 10 years ago that I put down my first commit for, you know, what, what was then Plone Social which was an attempt to, and that started out basically as, as a, you know, as a add on based on Plonet discussion. So it was really an effort to use Plon native components to bring this, uh, this, this social experience alive. And so instead of having to install external databases, like, can we do this just in Plon and Zope data structures? And that's huh. how it all got, uh, got rolling. Huh. And then it sort of picked up because it certainly got much bigger than you and your brother, I think you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that's really interesting. And, uh, you know, we, we've talked in the preparation about, you know, let, let's reminisce about Sorrento. And actually Sorrento is where, where all the, you know, the major work was done for this. Uh -huh. uh, so for those people who don't know that, like Sorrento is this, this magical getaway place just south of Naples in Italy. And it's, it, you know, it, it had become a pilgrimage for me, like over the years to go there and, you know, every, you know, celebrate the start of spring and beautiful weather and having, you know, all kinds of interesting people, you know, in the blown community around you. And it was just that atmosphere of like exchanging ideas. And I was talking about my research there. I look back, you know, at some of the presentations I did. So I presented about this knowledge uh, management research and about my experiments in implementing that in blown and people were interested. And so I said, you know, I'm, I'm writing the code, like, you know, we can collaborate. And I got some really useful tips there as well, like Moritz van Wees, who, who pointed out that, you know, the way I was doing it would, would have performance bottlenecks. And he suggested like a different way of doing that, which I, I picked up, you know, I, I basically, you know, took his approach and started implementing that. So, and a lot of really interesting contacts uh, that, you know, that we built up uh, in, in, in those meetings. And then it, yeah, then it quickly gained steam when, when we started doing that. And then it became, it, it became a collaboration amongst a, a number of uh, kind of plone involved vendors. Am I right? That that yeah, that, that, that was within uh, one or two years that you know. So so I started. You know, I just put out plone social. It was just completely open source. Uh, like you know, here's the code. It's on GitHub. It's on PyPy. Install it and and, and run it. 
and then we quickly got this 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 combination of companies who were interested in that and we started talking about okay how can we do this right like in terms of doing real product development on this so that became Plone Internet and the Plone Internet Consortium, which was kicked off by NetSide at the time. They attracted funding for doing uh, inno innovation research. Uh, so we set up a joint product project with uh, me and with a, uh, a scientist from uh, Rotterdam about you know organizational culture change and how can we uh, fit the software into that. So we did a lot of uh, design research. Like how can we bring the best of LinkedIn and of Twitter, all these interaction patterns? How can we distill that into a new user experience on top of Plone? And yeah, and then it gained more momentum, and uh, we 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 reached a formal agreement with uh, with you know it was nine founding companies of the Internet Consortium, ah, and they put money on. I forgot yeah. that it was that many companies. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So they put money on the table, basically, uh, to sponsor my work and and the designers' work and and bringing this all together. And we then coordinated this whole swarm of uh, company resources that you know people made programmers available, and we divided the work and we quickly did the first iterations of uh, what you know what was then called Plone Internet and later became branded, you know, rebranded into Quave. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so what what were sort of the original set of features that that you worked on? In in I mean, you you're talking about it's it's all about the social and 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 I'm, and I'm I need I need more details to to latch on to exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, that's interesting because basically the, the core feature set it's it's like it was envisioned at the start and it's it's still the core feature set, and that's that's basically four fourfold. So one thing is the activity stream, basically your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed or your LinkedIn feed. So that's really the time driven feed of what's going on, the pulse of the organization, and. Next to that, we have uh, the second major lag is workspaces. So we took uh, something uh, which is employed, which is collected the workspace, which takes all this amazing security apparatus that we have employed, and you know it turns it into like this this self-contained area. So we can have really secure areas where basically we have like we can have a hundred different workspaces, which uh, with a hundred different policy configurations within a single organization. So that's a really powerful feature that you can have where you know people can either you know collaborate completely you know bottom up uh, in an almost anarchist like self-governed way, and that can coexist with very top-down, very structured collaboration and, and ma management-oriented workspaces and anything in between. Is that is that an add-on that David Glick created? Am I remembering? Yes, yes. So the core of that, the collective workspace, it was built by David Glick. And then, and then it was built, in, in fact, with, with for our work, the Jazz Curtis work for the Mountaineers website, which has a very, it's a volunteer-led, member-driven website with a lot of complex permission issues where there are a lot of little, it, people yeah. don't think of it as workspaces in that context because it's yeah. more like they're they're offering courses and activities and different yeah. people are leading the, the so but it has the same the same idea of yeah. you have to do a lot of definition of roles and and who belongs to which <laughs> which areas of the site yeah. yeah 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 so that's interesting I had not realized yeah. that, that collection we, we took we that. took that and ran with it and we still use that but we also heavily customize that so we have a big layer of you on top of that in terms of you know how do you set these policies and you know we have certain rules about how, how that should all work and so yeah, each yeah. of these workspaces has its own activity stream again as well so it's like this this whole matryoshka doll of, uh, uh, of you know, yeah it's really like every document has its own conversation on the document and they're all mm -hmm. aggregated in the workspace so you can see what's going on in my team and mm -hmm. that's all aggregated again in the whole sidewide activity stream based and on the permissions are sort of um are they sort of more chat-like or more discussion thread-like? It's you know the latter. We start, yeah, we started out with with flat discussion threads, so no nested replies, but still, like it's an async conversation that you're having. It's not like fully real-time stuff that you would have in a chat. We okay. also have a chat component, but you know the, the emphasis here basically on on replacing email. And also recontextualizing the conversations. So if you have email, you know, you're just mailing documents around. Everybody has, you know, different versions of what's supposed to be the same document. And if you're unlucky, you're being left out of the CC or you're just missing part of that. <laughs> and we put it all together and you have the document and the conversation on the document in one place. And everybody right. can see that, you know, if gotcha. they want to. Gotcha. Cool. 
Cool. And that's actually a major a major thing of what we're doing is is you know moving from a push system. So a lot of organizations they operate on a push principle, like you push out, you know, you want that that guy to be involved, or you just CC everybody who you think might be involved, and people get completely overwhelmed with all that information. And we turn that on its head and we say, you know, make everything available within Quave, within your Quave installation. And people can subscribe to the stuff that they find interesting. People can find out what they think they need instead of other people shoving information at them. Yeah. Which yeah, is, yeah. I think, an empowering move that that like fits the whole open source ethos as well. Yeah. Yeah, actually, speaking of open source, um, can you say a little bit about the open source model that you're using for it? I, I seem to remember that there was a, it, at least for a while, it wasn't fully open source. You had to be a member of the consortium or something like that. It's still it's still that way. So so technically, legally, it's it's fully open source. It's GPL v2, and that's required for any plone derivative. And we stick to that. But in terms of the community model, we we shifted uh, away from that. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to say that actually, I, I would have loved uh, that to pan out differently. And so we mm -hmm. started out with like shipping both a paid version and a, a free uh, community version, which was mm -hmm. basically the previous release that we put out. But we, we weren't we weren't able or maybe you know the space doesn't doesn't allow for that that there's like you know when you're talking about Plone, you have this whole ecosystem of all kinds of companies using Plone and contributing to Plone. Right. And we did we weren't able to establish that kind of collaboration regime around uh, Plone Internet or what what became Quave. It's basically it's it's much more traditional product development. It requires huge upfront investments to do it right. And yeah, we found we we yeah we found a few people you know pulling that card and uh, and then you need to like okay we need we need to we need to make sure we can keep on doing that and we need to have a revenue stream and we need to do it like that. So our clients they get a full GPLv2 uh, license on that, uh, but we're not giving it away for free. Uh huh. Gotcha. Gotcha. And actually, that works out nice because a lot of our clients they they do care about open source and for them it's important that they have this GPL license. Uh, so that they know that you know they're they're committing to this relationship with us as their suppliers, but if they want to, they can just take the product and maintain it themselves if they if they want to. And oh right, right. That's, that, that's a nice a nice exit uh, strategy. Right. So is there still a sort of less feature rich free version, or is it just the one that you're talking about? No, we stopped doing that because okay. uh, first of all, it's a lot of work to put out uh, such yeah. a version. For sure, and then you and then you find that other people start competing against you uh, using your own product, which is not a really nice experience. Not a good business model. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> if you go into a tender and your competitor is offering your product, yeah, yeah. you know that something mm -hmm. is, is off. Yeah. So, why don't you say a little bit about the kinds of organizations that are using Quave now? What what kind of client base is there? It's fair, right? But I think like the the center of gravity is in the not for profit and the like the, the more social side of our stuff, governmental organizations, mm -hmm. healthcare centered. Yeah, I, so I would imagine a, fairly large organizations that, because the, of the need to coordinate discussions around documents, etc. It, so, it sounds like something that the teams are more than one or two people. <laughs> Yeah, it does fit large organizations uh, and like, you know, one of our largest clients currently is the uh, Bundeswehr University, so the, the German uh, Army University and also the University of München is a client, uh, I think, uh, of Sisla. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it also goes down to, to smaller organizations and I think the defining characteristic is, you know, is often it is organizations that are networked organizations. So if you have this this siloed corporate uh, environment where everything is Microsoft, they don't need a solution like Wave. They will just you know, like use you know whatever fits into their Microsoft stack. But mm -hmm. if you have like an organization that has a lot of partner organizations and you want to bring people together from all those organizations mm -hmm. and they all have different stacks, you need kind of like a neutral account where everybody can easily log in without having like to set up a thousand layers of single sign-on or whatever. Right, um, right. We do offer single sign-on, like, but you can just you know, like deploy Quave, and and you you have a use a nice user experience for all those people. So right, we're right. seeing a lot of those uh, cases. Oh, cool. That makes sense. Um, and also, we're now working. We're now working with Emio, which is a Belgian loan centric uh, provider. Mm -hmm. They are like a, a shared service center for uh, governmental organizations in Belgium. And they are now uh, rolling out Quave to all of their clients, which are municipalities, and, mm. and those scale from you know pretty small in terms of you know 
a few tens of people to like you know really big organizations. Mm-hmm. So it's a place in terms of size. Oh, yeah. So the uh, the client base is is c- continues to expand. It sounds like. Yes, and we're also experimenting with uh, Quave Cloud, so having a full self service offering. Uh, and that's also attractive for smaller organizations, I guess, which, you know, it's sort of just have this, this, this turnkey offering where I just, you know, basically you throw in a coin and you have a solution. Huh. And that's, that's, appeal- that's appealing to certain organizations as well. So um, no customization required, is, uh, no branding. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what you mean by self-serve. Why don't you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so self-service means that basically no consultancy required. So currently there's a lot of uh, features in uh, Quave that can be tweaked. Mm-hmm. So we don't do a traditional loan customization like, you know, well, we do that as well, like you know, write some custom extensions, but we don't tweak the whole engine for a specific client because that's not feasible in a business sense. It's not maintainable if you mm-hmm. basically have a fork, you know, where every client runs its own fork of the software. <laughs> yeah, so we have this, this, you know, we have this monolithic model of like, this is our stack. That's what you'll be using. You have requirements that are not served by the stack. Okay, we'll find out a way to add them to the stack generically and not for mm-hmm. your customer. And that then often involves like tweaking certain configuration records to, you know, turn certain features on, turn other features off, or maybe have some good configuration values. And we're now working on putting a UI on all of those options. So that you can actually choose that for yourself with some same defaults, obviously. Right. And then right. theme, theming, theming still needs to be done. Like you really want like some color scheme uh, that that fits your organization. Right, right. And we're looking at like indeed how we can we you know can we make that self service as well. Right, but right. But for, down the road. but for an organization where the features of Quave out of the box match what they need, they don't need yeah. like what you just said, then. Uh, here you go, here it is. And at the moment, the self-serve uh, version of it would be something that one of the partners would host for such clients or clients can host it themselves or how does that work? It's both, it's both. So we have like, we have a, a cloud uh, center in, uh, in Germany. Uh, like we have a, you know, a really secure hosting partner that does that for us. And we huh. set up Grave, of course, but they, they provide the platform. Mm-hmm. But we also have clients that that insist on uh, doing it on premise, mm-hmm. and we right. work with them. But but that's you know that's that's a different piece of cake because then you know the client needs to be savvy enough to maintain that yeah, infrastructure. Sure. And, and, yeah, sure, it's it's a big it's a big stack. Yeah, and then the self serve clients presumably they get to change the logo and a few colors or something. But basically, they yeah, are- that's 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 the first. First thing I want, uh, you know, our designer is not very happy about that because he wants to actually look at the balance of the fonts and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So it reminds me of the old uh, custom skin directory with the logo. Yeah. And the CSS it's, what, it's what people, you know, ask for and it's not necessarily, yeah. yeah. We're, we're quite keen to make sure that the user experience has, has a high level that we have. Yeah, so yeah. We'd, we'd rather have the client spend like, you know, give us a few hours and we'll, we'll create a very nice uh, thing for you. Uh, yeah, that, that sure. will make everybody happy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have, I know Plone has in often been thought of as being very uh, conscious of accessibility. Is does that extend to Quave as well? Is that something yeah. you put a fair amount of effort into? So, I mean, I'm yeah, extremely you're talking extremely. about it being yeah. used for major universities, etc. Usually, they have strong accessibility requirements. So, I'm imagining yeah. that you do. Yeah, so the, the accessibility in the formal sense, like are you, you know, like WCIG uh, compliant, and we do that, of course, and we might, that's a must-have in, for the markets we operate in. Right. But be, beyond that, we we get a lot of feedback that people love our product because it's so easy to use. Like mm-hmm. you don't need need training to use that. People see it and they immediately understand the uh, right. the user interface and metaphors that we're using. And so, it's very yeah. So excellent usability, excellent. Yeah, that that's really one of our major yeah. major selling yeah. points that we have. That yeah. yeah. Is the is the um, well, I suppose. So there's all the social stuff has its own UI, but the underneath that there's some content management that's happening as well. Is that is the content management side of the UI quite different than stock clone, or is that fairly yeah. similar in this the other stuff that has the that you brought your designer in for? No, you, you don't see any blown UI if you're using Quave. Mm-hmm. It's it's all custom UI. And actually, I think I would estimate that that about half our code is front-end code, actually. Mm-hmm. 
So it's really, really, uh, you know, everything is customized in that sense, and everything has the same like design language that that you use. So, so in that sense, it's a seamless experience. Gotcha, gotcha. And, and even like the, the editor that we use, like yeah, well, we have different editors, but you know, the editing experience is very similar between uh, doing a social post or doing like writing a page. Mm. Have you like traditional content management? Yeah. Have you ever felt? Oh boy, Plone really should work more like this. Just the certain core uh, features of Plone, and and you wanted to <laughs> string grab Plone by that's, the it's, that, that's a difficult. Yeah, no, uh, it's it's more like it's a difficult question. It's a struggle, you know, between like me as a developer and and the designer, for example. Like I know so intimately how Plone works that for me it's completely natural. Yes, uh, but he, you know, he has like why, why, why. So we, we have to work a lot around that. And, you know, like if, if you take like the intersection of workflows and role-based access controls, and, you know, it can be become mind-bogglingly complex. So a lot of the work we're doing is actually, it's actually a good thing because as developers, <coughs> we have this amazing, powerful toolbox that is blown, which in my opinion is way too complex to give in the hands of like, a lot of the users that we're working with, I'm not talking about the power users that really know, you know, plumb through and through, but you know, for a casual user, it can be completely overwhelming. So we, in a sense, for example, we simplify the security model and then we give people like this, this simpler version, but we still use all the levers underneath to make that right. like that fluid experience uh, work. We just hide a lot of that complexity. Uh, right, right. And is there, is there more work under development now? The new features yeah. being added that you want to talk about a little bit? Yeah, yeah. There's always, always an, an, an endless uh, set of stuff that, that we're doing. So stuff we recently did, for example, that we'll be shipping soon is an improvement to our preview system. So we have a paradigm in which um, all documents in Plone, if you look at them or if you search them, and that's also based on an open source component, collective document viewer which you then took and tweaked just like we did with the uh, workspace component. So we're improving that side and, you know, having more crisp SVGs so you can actually read Word documents. It's currently already there, but we're, we're just, you know, making that more efficient. You can read a Word document without opening Word or whatever. It's just on the page. It's in the browser. That's something we're doing. And um, let me, let me look at my ship log because I forget what we're doing. <laughs> Too much to remember. Yeah, we, we recently shipped a major uh, notification system upgrade. Mm. So that, that means that, you know, when you're mentioned in the system, you get an email like, you know, somebody, you know, mentioned or somebody added a command to a, a discussion that you could have to do or a document that you're watching, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And when you say that you're releasing this, it, the, the all nine, um, it's nine members of the consortium now, everyone kind of works together, or maybe a subset of the crew will be working on features, but everyone is sharing somehow? Most partners dropped off uh, in, the, in the past years. So it's, uh -huh. it's been like, it's the hardcore that remains that, that, uh -huh. that moves on. Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. So when, when we're talking about shipping, it's really about shipping to our clients. Uh -huh. Okay. So gotcha. we have a structured release process where we ship a release every about every two months, and that oh, no. goes to uh, intensive quality assurance and testing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And, and then and then we send out a release now to our clients. Like this is what's coming up. Yeah, and the clients are primarily in the EU or, or in Europe. Uh, is that right? That's kind of my impression. I'm not sure why yes. I have that impression. Yes, yes. I don't think we currently have any uh, clients outside the EU. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's so interesting yeah. that it kind of gained traction in Europe and not so much in the U.S. I'm not sure why. <laughs> I think I do know why because uh, we, you know, I did a lot of research into organizational culture when starting Coif mm -hmm. and, and when doing design, and it seems to correlate to a specific set of you know organizational culture types, like you know stuff that we find in, in mm. Germany and in the Netherlands, for example, and. We, of course, we did extensive work in the UK as well with NetSide. Mm -hmm. And you know, I visited internet conferences in, in the UK and I found, oh, that's a completely different vibe that be, of what people are expecting yeah. and doing that is in the Netherlands. And I think that's true for uh, for the US as well. That's it's really a different market in terms of what, what people need, what organizations expect. That's really interesting. And I suppose you could say in a sentence or two how it's different. That's a really fascinating thought. But... Yeah, so, so the, par 
the paradigm I'm using, uh, it differentiates, for example, between commercially driven organizations and more, you know, and a, a different step then is more consensus driven organizations. Mm. And that latter step, that's really strong in the Netherlands. And I guess also in your own client base, I mean, that falsifies the whole thesis because, you know, if you're working with non-governmental organizations, they typically will have that, <coughs> that stakeholder concern. Mm -hmm. But not so but much for corporate US. Well, for the, yeah, for the mainstream internet market, I think that, that that's like, that's more, much more difficult to, to break yeah. into that. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's true that that has a very... A certain connotation that's quite different you're right <laughs> yeah and well, it moves slow i think that that's one of the main lessons that i learned in the past uh, 10 years like i never thought it would like take that long to gain traction and in, in these markets these mm. are really slow moving markets yeah interesting interesting well this has been um uh, this has been really great to learn more about quite it's so so funny that although we've chatted in Sorrento together on many topics. I don't think we ever had an in-depth conversation yeah. about Quave like yeah. this. So this is great. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, uh, Sally. Absolutely. Thank you so much yeah. for sharing. Yeah. It was a pleasure being with you. <laughs>